You know, friends, a criminal trial, at least in part, can be a little like a popularity contest. And given some of the evidence that will be introduced in the case that's about to kick off up in New York, Donald Trump is going to be the most unpopular person in that courtroom. Let's talk about that, because justice matters. Hey all, Glenn Kirshner here. Well, friends, this will surprise exactly nobody, but Donald Trump just lost another motion trying to delay the start of his trial, which will begin in a New York courtroom on Monday, April 15th. And if you count up all of Donald Trump's losses, all of his attempts to delay the start of his trial, which have been rejected by judges, it would probably total, you know, one, two, three, four, carry the two, the umpteenth time Donald Trump has lost. Really just a record setting string of losses. Some might call him the biggest loser. So let's start briefly with the new reporting on Donald Trump's most recent loss. And then let's spend a few minutes talking about how a criminal trial in some ways can be a bit of a popularity contest and how the least popular person in the courtroom typically doesn't fare so well. Let's start with a new reporting. This from HuffPost. Headline, judge rejects last ditch Trump attempt to delay hush money trial. And that article begins, the judge in Donald Trump's hush money criminal case on Friday turned down the former president's request to postpone his trial because of publicity about the case. It's the latest in a string of delay denials that Trump has gotten from various courts this week as he fights to stave off the trial start Monday with jury selection. Among other things, Trump lawyers had argued that the jury pool was deluged with what the defense saw as exceptionally prejudicial news coverage of the case. The defense argued that was a reason to hold off the case indefinitely. Judge Juan Mershon said that idea was not tenable. Trump appears to take the position that his situation and this case are unique and that the pretrial publicity will never subside. However, this view does not align with reality, the judge wrote. He, Judge Mershon, said questioning the prospective jurors would address any concerns about their ability to be fair and impartial. Prosecutors had objected to Trump's request, saying that the publicity wasn't likely to wane and that Trump's own comments generated a lot of it. Prosecutors also noted that there are over one million people in Manhattan and said jury questioning could surely locate 12 who could be impartial. You know, friends, I litigated a lot of motions in my 30 years as a prosecutor. I won some, I lost some, but when attorneys are litigating motions, judges will often say things like, well, you know, Mr. Prosecutor, the facts as I understand them don't fully support your argument. Or, you know, Ms. Defense Attorney, the, the case you cite as precedent is slightly different than this case. But you know what I've never heard a judge say? Uh, Mr. Defendant, in this case, Defendant Trump, your view does not align with reality. Now, friends, you think Judge Mershon has had about enough of the BS arguments from Donald Trump and his lawyers? So, friends, let's take just a few minutes to talk about how a criminal trial can be a little like a popularity contest. Now, don't misunderstand me. I don't think the jurors decide guilt or innocence based on 
you know, the popularity of the prosecutor versus the defense attorney or the popularity of the judge or the popularity of the defendant. But popularity, likability, is all part and parcel of a criminal trial, and it is an important part. I mean, you want to be popular, popular, you want to be well-liked. That goes for the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, and the defendant. So by popularity, here's what I mean. Let's take the judge, for example. When I was trying cases, I wanted to be the one who was most popular with the judge. What do I mean by that? Well, when we're you know, arguing legal issues or talking about what the facts are and what inferences should be drawn from those facts, when we are offering um, appellate court opinions, precedent, and you know, discussing how that precedent does or does not apply in this case, I wanted to be as honest and straightforward and accurate as I could be. For example, if there was a case out there an appellate court opinion, some precedent that cut against the argument I was making to the judge. Hopefully I had some precedent that supported my argument, but if I had what's called contrary authority, I made sure to bring that to the judge's attention. I would say, judge, there are these cases that support the government's position, but there's this one case that undercuts it. It's contrary authority. Now, let's talk about it and let me try to distinguish it and say why it shouldn't be fatal to the position that we're taking. You wanna be the one who, in a very real sense, is most trusted by the judge to be completely straight, to be an officer of the court, to call everything down the middle, to not overstate or understate, to not exaggerate, and certainly not to deceive the judge. So yes, all of the attorneys wanna be the one who is the most popular with the judge. Um, When it comes to the jury, I've talked to a lot of juries after my cases were over, the cases that I tried in D.C. Superior Court, not so much in federal court because the rules are different about communicating with jurors after a case has um, concluded. But I've talked to a lot of jurors, and let me tell you, yeah, it can be a real popularity contest in there. You know, did the jurors like or dislike the prosecutor, the defense attorney, Um, the judge, the witnesses, and the defendant, even if the defendant didn't speak a word during the course of the trial because the defendant chose not to testify, invoked his or her Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, declined to take the stand, as is a defendant's constitutional right. Boy, it often seemed like it was, at least in part, a popularity contest in the eyes of the jurors. And here's the thing. The attorneys, the prosecutors, the defense attorneys, they want to be the most popular person, the most popular counsel in the eyes of the jury because you want the jury to trust you, to to believe that you're giving it to them straight. You're not overstating or understating. You're not trying to deceive. That's one of the reasons in opening statements, prosecutors will make sure to front all the bad evidence, the weaknesses in their case. It's called drawing the sting. You want to be the one to say, yes, Michael Cohen lied previously, and let's talk about what that means. But the prosecutors want to be the ones to bring all of the warts, all of the problems with the evidence and the government's case to the jury's attention because you build credibility in the eyes of the jury if you do that. So yes, you want to be the most popular attorney. But, you know, popularity when it comes to the defendant, maybe more precisely likability, because there's only one defendant, unless it's a co-defendant case, Um, likability, popularity in the eyes of the jury is huge. And let me tell you about one piece of evidence that I think we may have forgotten over the course of the last year or so that will make Donald Trump the most unpopular person in that courtroom. So, friends, it was about a year ago now that the first indictment of a criminal former president of the United States was handed down by a grand jury. It was that New York grand jury. And after Donald Trump was indicted, um, DA Alvin Bragg, the Manhattan District Attorney, released the indictment publicly, which is entirely proper. It's a public document. And you may recall that something called a statement of facts accompanied 
the indictment, and it kind of set out some of the facts and some of the evidence in the case, again, entirely proper under the procedures uh, in New York. In the federal system, we call it a speaking indictment. In the New York state court system, it's called a statement of facts that accompanies the indictment. And let me just set this up. Remember, Donald Trump was indicted for making these corrupt hush money payments to Stormy Daniels to try to keep her mouth shut. He then falsified business records, a crime under New York state law, to try to conceal the true nature of the hush money payments. And remember, he also said in his, you know, lackeys and mouthpieces said, well, well, this had nothing to do with the campaign. This, you know, was just entirely to try to protect Melania's feelings. You know, Donald Trump didn't want to offend her. He didn't want this information to become public. With that in mind, let's look at the statement of facts that accompanied the indictment in this case. It's uh, 44 paragraphs long and buried right in the middle. It's actually paragraph 19. Is the evidence that this jury will hear about what was really going on regarding these hush money payments? It reads, the defendant, Donald Trump, directed lawyer A, Michael Cohen, to delay making a payment to woman two, that's Stormy Daniels, as long as possible. He instructed Michael Cohen, lawyer A, that if they could delay the payment until after the election, they could avoid paying altogether. Because at that point, it would not matter if the story became public. So let's recap. It was not about protecting Melania's feelings because Donald Trump said, let's just delay the payment that we promised to make her, that we signed a contract pledging to make these payments to Stormy Daniels. Let's delay it until after the election because that way we don't have to pay her. And that way, when, if it comes out after I've been elected, it won't matter. What happened to Melania's feelings, Donald? Think about what this jury will come to learn about that defendant, Donald Trump, sitting his big fat orange butt in the defendant's chair in that courtroom. What's his popularity gonna look like when they hear that one, he struck this corrupt deal to shut Stormy Daniels up, two, he falsified business records to cover up the true nature of the hush money payments, three, he claimed that it was all to protect Melania's feelings. And then four, he told Michael Cohen to delay the payments until after the election, because then it wouldn't matter. Who cares what Melania hears after I've been elected? He was even going to stiff Stormy Daniels the money he had entered into a contract to pay her. It's like insult on top of injury on top of despicable conduct, on top of callousness, on top of corruption, on top of crime. That man will be the most unpopular person in that Manhattan courtroom. He ought to be the most unpopular person in all of Manhattan, in all of New York, in all of the country, and the jury will see him for what he is, and they will take that evidence, friends, and they will hold it against him, and they will use it to convict him of his crimes in a New York minute. Because justice matters. Mm. Friends, as always, please stay safe, please stay tuned, and I look forward to talking with you all again tomorrow.